for those of you who don't know me, my name is Amanda Messino. I'm Associate Professor of Biology and Chair of Natural Sciences here at Houston Tillotson. I'm also the Chair of um, the Faculty Advisory Council, which is like our Faculty Senate. And in that role, it's been my honor to organize faculty events to welcome President Williams and celebrate her inauguration this week. So we had a radio broadcast on Monday, we had a faculty showcase yesterday, and today uh, the faculty are proud to present this event about transformative uh, female leadership in the arts. You will be hearing from two of our faculty members, uh, Professor Kruger and Dr. Martin, as well. Yes. <laughs> as well as our friends and collaborators from Raisin in the Sun, uh, Raisin Massentosh and Candy Cow. And, and the conversation is moderated by HD student leader DJ Taylor. Right. And the uh, board chair of Raisin in the Sun, Alexandra Anderson. So we're very grateful to all of them for being here, for sharing their time, grateful to you for being here for this conversation. And I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator. So thank you again. Well, thank you, Dr. Messina, for mentioning us. This is gonna be a conversation of empowering and uplifting women and people that are in the arts community. It's gonna be not your typical panel style. I do wanna thank HT for including us in the inauguration for Dr. Williams. She's an amazing person. If you haven't already had the opportunity um, to meet her. So our theme for the inauguration week is, I wanna make sure I say this one right, women as transformative leaders. And so I'm gonna address this to the entire panel, our, our um, Raisin in the Sun Candy, Dr. Martin, Dr. Kruger, anyone can come and um, chime in. What is transformative leadership look like to you? I'm gonna start with you since I'm working with you. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Wrong person. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just gonna build off of everybody else. <laughs> but okay, so transformative leadership to me, uh, if we just look at vocabulary, to transform a leader taking it, everybody with them, you know, they are guiding everyone to transform something for the better. Yes. Absolutely. Simple. Absolutely. Um, you want me to piggyback on that? Yeah, okay. this is conversation style. Um, I think I love what she said because I think a transformative leader is somebody that understands the power in making your dream come true and elevating others' dreams, right? Mm -hmm. And making their dreams a reality, right? So oftentimes when I think of transformative uh situations I think of I used to watch HGTV a long time ago and I used to watch in 30 minutes you could see a space before and then the after within 30 minutes right they would come in and transform the space right and so I think for me that's what a leader has the ability to do for folks right and I think there's levels of it um but I think as women it's it's empowering and it's it's a very powerful time right to exude this essence of transformation right and how to help other young women and people of color um to really understand that potential and opportunity to transform as well and women are visionary they are and so you need vision yes. you need to have yes. a vision before you could even begin to move from one place to the next Absolutely. because without a plan without a vision you're just kind of running around in a circle right and so transformative means to move from one place to the next in a very creative, in a very humane, in a very justice environment way. It's just not just moving. Right. It's just not changing. And I'm gonna add upward mobility. There you go. This isn't a lateral move. Like we moving forward and upward. Right. Sometimes lateral to get there though. Yeah. Because lateral helps you to bring others. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah. And then you go together. Well, I'm leading, so I'm moving up. <laughs> like, yeah, follow behind me. I got this. Janine is my little sister. Mother says. <laughs> okay, Candy, did you want to chime in? Um, yeah, I guess to me, leadership is um, almost kind of ambiguous. I don't feel like I've had a lot of leadership roles in my life, but um, I think indirectly, um, there's, I think there's a good balance, uh, I think, with transform, transformative leadership to me. It means 
the model behavior that inspires others to want to change for themselves. Yes. Um, I think, you know, you can have bad leadership and it can transform things, but I think true change comes from wanting that um, truly for yourself. Um, but yeah. I, I had more. I lost my train of thought. That was amazing. <laughs> that was super amazing. D <laughs> DJ, did you want to say um, anything? You know, being an HT student and having the opportunity to be encompassed with transformative leaders, and now you have, is she the second female president? The yes. Mm -hmm. Second female president for the university. Honestly, as an HT student, I feel like if you told somebody, like, what? more than, you know, 100 years ago when the school was just starting out, like, you know, baby, like two colleges, they wouldn't believe that women have gotten this far mm -hmm. and how women have broken down barriers and have, you know, try to change the younger generation to the younger generation. And then, like, the, I just believe the evolution of transformative leadership, especially with women, is so impactful, especially as an HBCU student, like a small HBCU student. Mm -hmm. But speaking of breaking down barriers, you know, you say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Martin, well, have you experienced times in your career where you had to break down barriers, especially as a woman of color? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, there are times that normally I'm in my friends, in my circles, I don't use the word doctor because I'm in relationship with people and sometimes titles interfere with that, break it up. But there are times when I was in specific environment with men who would say, Rosalie Martin, I'm a doctor to you. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and I had, I was married and my husband was reverend and they were, some people would call and say, may I speak to Dr. Wingate? I was Wingate then. I said, I'm she. No, I want to speak to Dr. Wingate. Mm -hmm. I am she. Do you want Reverend Wingate? Right. And so sometimes there's this assumption that the doctor in the house is male. Mm -hmm and white at that, by the way, mm -hmm. white male. And there are other times just being present here at Houston Tillerson that I had to be, um, I was pegged as the rebel rouser or the disturber because- uh, <laughs> Sometimes you, you know, need disruptors, you need disruptors. You know, 50 years you can't have smooth sailing at no. an institution. So sometimes I had to do my thing here and I recognized that it was not just for me. It was really for the well-being of our students. I'm so concerned about that our students get the best model modeling. And so I'm just always there for them. So thank you for asking that question. Can I say something real quick? I told you I talked to your friends yesterday. Or uh. you, um, <laughs> and so they were said that you have always been a woman that is about the equity and uplifting of women, especially women of color, and that you are just a genuine, genuine, loving person. I also heard about when you were in school, the discriminations that you had to go against when it came to like housing here in Austin. You, you heard all that. Girl, I do my Girl, research. <laughs> <laughs> I do my research. That's but true. to even touch and tell everyone that, because you, you're the, if I haven't said this, the oldest tenure faculty here at HT has been at, here at HT for over 50 some years. Um, yeah, look at you. Yeah. Um, but you saw what Austin is today 50 years ago was not Austin. And so coming to Austin, if you're not, are you originally? I'm from New York City. Okay, that's what I was saying. Coming to Austin and being from the north to the south and the issues and barriers, since we're talking about barriers that you were faced, even when it came to housing and being a student here. So could you chat a little bit more about that? Okay, so I wasn't a student at Houston Tillerson. I actually, my husband was in El Paso in the military. That's how I left New York City to come to this Texas, which was wildlife, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I spent two years in El Paso, came to Austin to get my master's in social work. So that was my job, my career, I thought but a calling on my life was to be here at Houston Tillotson. And it was never, ever my intentions to be a teacher. And yet I have been here longer than anyone in the history of this institution. And I know it's because of God's, just God's grateful and blessing on me. 
So ironically, I was when I came to Austin, we were looking for some place to stay at the time. By the way, y'all know rent was like $85 a month in an apartment, <laughs> including utilities. That must be in $85. Yeah, yeah. $85. Yeah. Go back. It's 3000 around the corner. I know, right? <laughs> including utilities. <laughs> However, I, I didn't I didn't know the city, and they're, uh, they're part of the city still that's very segregated. And so I looked at the newspaper and looked for an apartment. And so I went, I went in person, and, and the person said, oh, "You didn't tell me you were black." Mm. I went to another person, and they said, "We just rented it." And I called this, and they said, "Oh yeah, come on over." I said, "Really?" And then they hung up on me because they heard my "really." Yeah. Right? Mm. And then a third person wow. didn't let me, didn't didn't allow me in their place. They spaced because they said. It's not us, but my mama's house, and she doesn't want to lose any other tenants. This is 1967 in Austin, Texas. But the irony of all this was we end up, my husband and I end up living, rooming with somebody, because initially we couldn't find a place. And it was less than about four or five blocks from Houston Tillerson, not knowing this was my journey. Wow. I, I, that's why I know it's a calling on my life. All the pieces came together, and eventually I'm here. So yeah. I'm gonna just sit down there. I just wanna listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just get it out. Just want to be one of my favorite people. Oh, that's awesome. Just wanna open this question up to everybody. It was this how you got to break down, you know, barriers in your career as a woman of color? Uh, I'll go. Um, so I have a friend here uh, that I um I used to teach. Right, so for a while I taught, for many years actually, before I got into the day job I, I have now, but um, I was an ESL, English as a Second Language Teacher. And um, it was very interesting, the decade that I was uh, in education on a secondary level for high school students. I, I, I sometimes, because I had this vision of what I wanted to do, it was, it was bigger than education, right? Uh, and I was trying to figure out how to get out to be able to get to this level. And a lot of times it felt like purgatory sometimes, even though I love the students, because I felt like it was a systematic racism and a bunch of barriers, right, that would just hover over you and, and you only had this much power to make that difference, right? You could make differences in 30 <laughs> kids' lives in the year and it was something, right? I wanted to make that difference on a grander scale. Mm -hmm. And um, it was difficult, right? Mm -hmm. You had language barriers, you had poverty bar barriers from students that would carry that from where they were from, because I taught in a predominantly, um, you know, of color neighborhood and poverty stricken neighborhoods in Houston. And the students would bring that to the classroom and you would have to kind of break through that and get them to understand who they were. So you talk about transformational leadership, you could see a kid transform in the secondary level in high school from a freshman to the senior, depending on what you would free, feed them and what you would expose them to. So it taught me a lot of times um, just how to deal with those different barriers. And, and I even, even in education, you know, being a woman and being gay, right? It was just always looked upon as just being different and um, you can't do this or you can't do that. And education attracted everybody on the spectrum, right? Any religion, you know, black, white, young, old, and um, it was very interested how your energy mixed into that, but I still kept the vision. Um, and so I think education and my teaching career had the most barriers in my life, but it also inspired me to really understand how to work through that and be water, right, to flow to understand that every individual person has their own journey to success. Um, and to me, time doesn't really exist. I felt like I was in teaching for a decade, but really, I was still free. Mm -hmm. I just had to realize that I was free, and I had angels around me. I had people coming and tell me, hey, you don't, you don't belong here. There's something <laughs> great on your life. Like, I don't know what it is, but it's something there. And I, and I stay patient. I stay patient, but I think it, for anybody else, it could have been a couple years, but for me, it took a decade and a half to realize the power of transformation, right? And that as women, we have ancestral ties and power that speaks to our journeys, it speaks to our dreams. So we got this, we got this, we just gotta step out and do it. So the barriers really don't exist for us, right? We just 
we create them and, and we make them a barrier and we have to jump over. But I think in actuality, they really don't exist because we have ancestors that have done things for us to be able to step on the backs of those folks. You know, it's interesting you said that. So my mother used to tell me all the time that I have blessings on the shelf yes. that I haven't used yet. And so right now, as I'm going, walking through my journey, something happens to me. I said, Mom, I'm using your blessing. <laughs> and I tell my students, I'm putting some blessings on the shelf for you. For you. My, oh, my, 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 I'm sorry, my children, my grandchildren, and through the generations. Yeah. Because that's the generational legacy that we, we leave behind for our kids. And uh, my mother did it in the way she could. We were raised on, on welfare, so we were extremely poor. So what she could give me is the sense of power, the sense of self the sense of you can do this, and I have blessings on that shelf for you. Amen. Can you, she's, <laughs> you, you still had to pass some notes. Um, <laughs> so, share, share that, that's beautiful. I'm gonna just add to that. Um, my biggest barrier has been myself, hmm. honestly. So hearing you say that, um, and, and then my, I have some traumatic past as well that helped create some of those barriers. And I'm just now getting to the point where I'm, I'm realizing how powerful I am. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like right now the universe loves me. And Hello. whatever I ask for, <laughs> I have been getting and I'm gonna keep asking until they stop. Yes. And I'm mm. gonna keep getting it even after that because I'll get it my, for myself. But um, just recently in February, uh, I got a couch back that my mother had reupholstered back in the day. And that was like her spiritual awakening at that moment. And I watched her reupholster this couch. And I was like, that's pretty dope. Like I was young, maybe seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. And the day that she put in the last staple in the back to, to close the couch up, she looked up at me and she said, I left something in here for you and your sister. And I said, well, what is it? And she was like, well, you just, if anything ever happens to me, you'll know one day. And it, it wasn't until late, my mother committed suicide when I was about 14 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that, you know, helped shape my life. But uh, 35 years after she upholstered that couch, I got the couch back because my, my dad had it first. I told my dad about what she said. And he was like, are you sure? Because he went and looked under the couch. <laughs> so I got the couch <laughs> and I opened the back up and my mother had a personal handwritten story um, about when she had an aneurysm. She dealt with migraines, that's something that I deal with. So it was like 35 years, the couch was 35 years when she got it. And it was like, it was happened in February, like it was dated February of 1988. And all of those like memories came back and I was like, I'm gonna reupholster this couch. Wow. But just having those connections and realizing that I could overcome a lot of my own issues, like I'm just now doing that today. And, and that's really helping my path. Well, speaker, I was just still gonna go with the breaking down barriers, you know. Uh, Miss Candy, you break down barriers every day. You're in a male-dominated industry right now, so like, how's it like being like a female mirror, female muralist in Austin? Um, actually, honestly, I feel like I'm at a very unique. Uh, cross point in public arts. Um, I think I'm very lucky to be on the cusp of a wave of you know, acknowledgement um, of public art as a legitimate art form. Mm -hmm. I really do not think as an artist that I'm breaking down as many barriers as my predecessors in this industry, but as a female artist, um, there are interesting challenges that arise, I think it comes honestly just from there not being as many female artists um, out there. It is growing exponentially, which is amazing to see how many female artists are in town. Um, but it's usually, it's a lot, honestly, just a lot of microaggressions or not even intentional, just a lot of, I'll literally be at a wall with a can in my hand and people will walk up and be like, ask the dude sitting next to me, like, hey man, are you should paint this wall? <laughs> 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 no, it's just, it's me. It's, it's cool. It's cool. Or they're, they're, I, the, I've literally, they've yeah. literally answered and been like, no, it's the girl over here, and the, his buddy will come up and be like, it's you, it's you, man. <laughs> like, this happens almost every, every time. time. It doesn't matter if I'm literally painting the wall or it's just a lot of presumptions about, um, I guess women in the arts and um, I, I I honestly I 
I really can't complain. I don't know what the public art industry or communities are like in a lot of other cities. But honestly, I feel like we have a very, very strong, here. Here. tight-knit, very, very healthy community in Austin. Um, honestly, uh, as far as the women, I've a lot of the women I've spoken to, I know there is great disparity in the wage gap between genders. But um, I'm actually really proud to say a lot of the women I've spoken to like a lot more than the men artists that I know in town. As they should be. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I don't know if it's stylistically um, what's more approachable for clients or if it is that women feel like we have to advocate stronger for ourselves or what it is, but um, it's very encouraging to be a part of that the wave. Movement. Yeah, um, I think it's really, really cool. And um, I think a lot of other things come down to, you know, just a lot of safety aspects. It's different being a female muralist. Um, sometimes you go to festivals and a lot of festival organizers don't think of things like safety or, you know, maybe don't place this female artist alone in this dark alley to paint this wall, you know, away from other sites and, you know, things like that. But um, overall, I, it's, it's a very interesting intersection to be at where I am currently in um, the state of where public art is in Austin, but um, uh, it's, it's really great to see more women getting into it for sure. Because not only is it more male dominated, it's more, I believe it's more white male dominated. Oh, for sure. So this strong backing of a community, are you able to find your voice more easily? Um, yeah, actually, um, going from traditionally, I've done my art my whole life. Um, I did a lot of canvas work and just naturally being an introvert, um, <laughs> when I'm painting at home, you just, you know, you paint at home. <laughs> you know, I don't talk to anyone. I have a kid now, so I'm literally at home all the time. Like 90% of the time I'm talking to a four-year-old, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> so um, it's been really interesting, actually, the transformation within myself doing public art because you have to put yourself out there. Um, even getting into public art was difficult for me. I'd always wanted to try it, but to practice doing murals, you need to have the space um, and you are going to make a lot of ugly things in a very public forum for lots of people to see. And it, it can be, you know, very discouraging, but you push through it. And honestly, going from being an introvert to being forced to be out, I have met an innumerable amount of people who have not only been become great friends, but truly, truly inspirational and life changing in my career and the trajectory of just you know the path that i'm taking in life yeah and it's i and i i never i would never put myself out there otherwise <laughs> if it wasn't for a painting i had a friend the other day that said uh, something about an irish hello instead of an irish goodbye i have such a hard time i don't know why saying hi to people <laughs> but if you come and say hi to me i'm like hi and so that's like me in public like I, I i just have to put myself out there and i'm grateful so grateful to all the opportunities and um you know leaders in the community who have given me chances to be able to put myself out there and find a voice because i i it, it, i struggled for a long time to find nice but I've seen your transition just even with just this project. Yeah, <laughs> it's been it's been a long. It's been a long, like Candy, you getting out there? We putting you out here? Like, yeah. She's like, no, I don't want to know. It's like, no, we putting you out there. But her, your transition and transformation as uh, as a woman, as an artist, and I remember even for if you guys see this, this is the mural that's going to be here on campus that Candy has designed. Mm -hmm. And just the I'm excited. Huh? I'm excited. <laughs> no, because look at it. Look at it. The uh, getting those and to up. see even the m many meetings that we had as far as like finding your voice and pulling from the community and understanding what that looks like. So I'm proud of you, Candy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of you, Candy. Oh. It, <laughs> I, 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 she's so powerful. Like, I don't want to. Help, um, piggyback on that. I think, I think, a lot of times in the art community and just this 
whole renaissance or movement, art, cultural mu movement, I think it's even more important to, because we know you're talented, but it's one thing to then be inclusive of what you're creating and incorporate other visions and voices. Like yes. you're not just throwing art up there, mm -hmm. you're looking to use art as a tool to solve issues, problems, yeah. mm -hmm. elevate people's voices. So when you don't say a word, that art's gonna speak, yeah. right? So it's like understanding how to utilize art. I mean, people are like, oh, are you an artist? No, I'm not the artist, I'm the organizer. I'm like, I'm trying to get a program together <laughs> to then hire artists and then get them in the position that they need to be in to then give voice yeah. and to help solve problems yes. and to help young, you know yes. what I mean? Like, so, yeah, it's like, yes. it's, it's, that is, art is a yes. gift, right? It's a gift and Super we have power. creatives here all around us right, that have the ability to be able to to do this art and then well, but what can we do with the art, right? How, how can we make moves and changes? And, you know, in this particular art piece, we had an en environmental justice theme and initiative. Mm -hmm. There has been historic trauma in the environment on the east side. And for, for we went through artist selection process. We included selection committee. She didn't just say, I want this art. Art she was project. Part of the selection committee. Yeah, she didn't just say, hey, I want to do this. She can't. She had to apply, go through a very highly competitive process. Yeah. And um, and so, girl, you deserve this opportunity. That's you're right. bringing intersectionality. You're bringing everybody together at a university that historical, that is a historical university here in this city that means a hell of a lot to a lot of people. And, and, and that is so important because um, this semester, I create a new class, even though I'm retiring, <laughs> and the new class is called Sociology and the Arts. Mm -hmm. So I chose um, to use artistic forms to teach gender and sexual orientation and race and social problems. And, and this, gives, this gives students a way of looking at these major concepts from a critical, creative way. Mm -hmm. And the many assignments they have were included artistic ways and formats. Mm -hmm. And so I consider myself an artist and I started at Absolutely. age 75. Yes. At age 75, I started doing art. And so I was really concerned about the abortion issue. So I, I, you know, I drew, I love that. it wow. says never again. Mm -hmm. But then I said yet again, <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, right? Yes, I'm, I'm right? still, like yes. it's 2023. Yet again. Yeah, Yet and we again. yes, and we are here at the same crossroads. Same crossroads that I had before Roe versus Wade. Yeah. Okay. And so, how is it <laughs> we we can, we can, we can <laughs> now use art to do that? And so, um, another piece I just created for social justice in terms of getting people to begin to think of what does this look like? Who we're looking at political parties, by the way, but not to think anybody. <laughs> But it's a way of asking what is going on in our country and our society and how can we make this thing different? Um, so my students now have an opportunity to draw, they have to create poems. The very last thing, they, we're looking at Audre Lorde, the intersectionality mm -hmm. of this amazing woman. And so one of their assignments is to look at the various aspects of her, who she is, her identity. Mm -hmm. And they chose, they chose to act out her life. One is choosing the fact that she's an artist, a poet. Another one, she's a woman, a mom. And so using art is such an amazing way to get to get us there. And so who knows, they may be part of this art in public places. I'm not yet, but hey, I may talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> I am retiring, you know. One of our board members, we had our meeting not too long ago, and he said, Alex, he said, we don't want to have that ageism when it comes to art. And so he was like, we need to tap into our, I call y'all active agers, because with my job, that's what they're called, <laughs> active agers. Um, but our seniors to see, like, get them involved. Like, it's the thing where it's like, oh, you hit a certain age, and then it's like. Not me. I know, okay. not you, <laughs> but I'm just saying. <laughs> like, you hit a certain age, and then it's like. What age? Age is a number. <laughs> so, look, A A R P age. A A R P age. 75. 75. But it's like around that age of like, okay, 
And then there just was, but they was like, he was like, no. And two, it's probably because he's one of our older board members. He was like, Alex, you need to tap into this and do stuff for the older creative community. And it restores balance, right? It gives it an intergenerational perspective on, you know, just, just who we are. We're not just young folks. And it's just, it's, it, we also have to coexist with people right. that have been here for many, many, many years that can then pass down wisdom to us, right? And make our journey a little less difficult, right? Yeah. If you actually listen or befriend older people, it's really incredible. It really is. Like you get the insights that's just on levels. <laughs> Dr. Kruger, I remember I was still in high school and I came here for a preview day and I remember, you know, going to the library and that was my first time ever seeing you and I believe you did a spoken word about police brutality. Oh, okay. Uh, and I know I'm not going to lie, right? that's that has resonated with me throughout my years at HT, and that's also part of the reason why I chose to come to HT. Wow. Just listening to you wow. and like hearing you out, I was like, cause like we don't specifically have something that goes towards the arts, but I'm like, you're in the English department, so, and you're still doing all this, that, and the third. So I just want to say thank you so much. Thank cause you. now I graduate this semester. And we also wanted to ask if there's any new um, projects that you're coming up with because I'm really what, Everybody's talking about their art. I'm going to talk about mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Go ahead, so man. for one, the poem that she's talking about that I did was a monologue. It was a poem and then it became a monologue because most of my poetry, that's my area. Uh, I'm a, I'm a po I was a poet for a long time until I realized I was a writer. Chick, wow. my poems. Oh yeah. Competitive oh, yeah. I'm the best. <laughs> I'm the best. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean you better know you the best and you better be okay with uh bragging about yourself because ain't nobody else gonna do it. Oh, I am the best. The best. Next to me, you know I'm a poet too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of my her. Um so that that poem became a monologue in a play and it i I consider myself an artivist because I use my art. Um art always pretty much reflect society. Either we're creating something beautiful to get you to forget about something. Mm -hmm. We're saying, hey, pay attention to this because it's gonna inform you about something that's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, something, art art has that ability to capture what's going on in the right. world, which is why people, you know, will look at in. eras and say, what was going on? What are the pictures telling us? What is the music telling us? What is the dance, what is the dancing telling us? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I tend to do with my art not only to talk about what's happening in society, but also because it's cathartic. Yeah. Like I use my own yeah. life um, because it's gonna be the most authentic. I know me more than anybody else. You know, I've been with me my whole life. Mm -hmm. So that's what I tend to write about. Um, I'm, <laughs> I am in Theater Now, New York's National Lab right now, mm -hmm. developing a musical. Yeah. Um, yes. And the, re <laughs> the reason why I wrote the musical is because of Working at HT, um, I fell in love with medieval literature when Dr. Old Mixon was here. Um, and then she later hired me to be in the English department. But um, I translate medieval texts into hip hop and urban language for accessibility because it does not exist. Wow. I wanted to do that for our students and for my community. And in doing that, one of them became a musical uh, based on Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, uh, so like good. Camelot and hip hop fused now. together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Making it accessible. You know? yes. uh, the other project that I'm, uh, I, I'm actually working about eight projects right now, but I'm just gonna tell you about a couple of them. The other one that I just submitted to Austin Film Fest this morning and two fellowships uh, is an anime pilot that I wrote. Um, and. The character, it, the, cult, the whole thing is called Ars Poetica and it's based on poetry, but this kid, he loses his mom. I told y'all my mom committed suicide. Um, his dad left him, so he felt very alone. And he has to deal with all of his traumatic past. He has a master of words, but no master of his own empathy. You know, like he don't care about nobody. So he roasts people, you know, if somebody comes for him, he's gonna kill them with the words. But he ha he gets in trouble with the law and he ends up getting sent to this like community program where poetry has to help heal him. Wow. Um, and so that's what the anime is about, battling his own demons, battling against other poets. And we're talking about poets with superpowers, y'all. Like he can literally spit fire. Wow. 
So it's going to be super dope, and I can show you guys pictures, you know, if you catch me after this, because I'm really hype about it. Um, but that was because the cre a creative is a visionary. It is. Like, creativity mm -hmm. is a superpower. I just told her that. Like, yeah. I'm super, y'all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the world that exists in Ars Poetica is based on an underword, underworld, where all the words go that people do not say. So when you're talking about being an introvert or you're talking about you know getting your voice out, um, think about all the things that you never say. If you're upset, if you're um, worried, if you know you could be in a relationship and you go, like, mm. it stays in here. Well, where do those words go? So I've created a world for that. But wow. yeah, those are just two of the projects I'm doing. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Shower with love, cause it's I mean, all yeah. women up here. I love I to mean. see it. I love to see it. Did you just flip your head, DJ? Oh yeah, I sure did. I love that. <laughs> I love natural, I love natural going on. But speaking of natural, I'm joking. I don't got no saving for that one. But you mentioned how your art, well, you know, the internet. You know how like your art is healing and you know it's very soothing. So how have you guys' own art, or maybe been inspired some way? How has that helped you heal from stuff that happened in the past that may come up in construction? Well, uh, art yeah. inspires art. Um, and I, I tend to surround myself with other artists because iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, you know, check out other art, it could be any type of art. Uh, I was at a museum in Houston one time and I was in there just wondering how people got their stuff on the wall. Cause I'm That's like, me. I'm That's looking me. across the, mm. the wall, the room, and there was a, a canvas. I'm going to say it's a canvas, but it was just all black. And I'm mm. like, who painted a canvas all black? <laughs> got it and it got it in the museum. <laughs> and people are coming to see it. Yeah. Well, when I walked up on the canvas, it was actually covered in flies. <laughs> and, and, the name, and the name of it was Carnage. And I was like, oh, that's why. That's Whoa, deep. that's deep, that's you know? Deep. And so I actually wrote a poem because, you know, poetry based on art exists. Mm -hmm. What is it called? That's with an E. Get Which of course. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm like, what? It completely, uh, yeah, I can't I know think of it right now, but too, yes. yes. Ekphrastic, ekphrastic that's art. True. That's true. Poetry based on art. Art. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wrote a poem about that. So that's, uh, that's how I tend to heal from things is to write about it. Uh -huh. Anytime I'm trying to figure something out, uh, anytime I've, spoken on a panel or or went and presented a paper i usually start with a poem because that's how i process my thoughts mm. and i'm much like her i use poetry for a variety of reasons to deal with social problems to deal with personal issues i've told people you if you want to know who i am read my poems mm. if you really want to know who, but i may not let you read them though <laughs> <laughs> depends you have to be very special for me to say here they are because poetry is a way of sharing who you are in very intimate, personal ways, mm -hmm. as well as surface, there's surface ways as well. And so in my classes, we may be doing something and then I'll stop and says, write a poem. And I'm a sociologist. And I think my next life, I'm gonna take, a, I'm gonna major in fine arts in my next life. I'm gonna major in marketing. We can write the jingles all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, if I could add a, a small bit to it, I think everything that uh, the ladies have said, I think to me, art is definitely a, um, a tool for healing. I've seen it heal on so many levels just in the last decade that we've been doing art initiatives and, and creating programs for solution-based uh, initiatives. But um, I think for, for me as a creative, right, um, I see uh, my canvas is space. Raisin writes poetry too, y'all. Don't let her. <laughs> I have many poems. So creative, <laughs> I, I do. I see opportunities to heal in other forms of art, right? Because I could build a house, right? I could mm -hmm. write poetry. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really good with wood. But I think my calling and purpose is for me to look at space in a different way, right? Look at ways to build communities through the arts and creating a opportunities for others to be inspired so that is the philanthropic side to me that then ties into the creativity that then heals me 
as well as give back. So I, I'm tapping into that, trying to transcend that, right? To understand that I don't have to necessarily be necessarily the poet or the painter or the musician. I can create in a different way mm -hmm. and still make an impact or a legacy. Yes, that's good. Did you want to say anything on that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know a lot of you, uh, you guys have been using the word healing, um, and I guess in a sense, art is healing, it's cathartic yeah. for me, but for very much of my younger life, it was escapism. I did it to escape from um, different things that I was going through through my youth. Um, we moved to the States when I was four or five. Um, I don't think I fully processed the, how traumatic that move was for me until honestly, very recently, a really good friend, the godmother of my daughter actually bought a book called I Dream of Popol. Um, and it's about a little girl who immigrates from Taiwan. And every single time I read that book to my daughter, I burst into tears. I kid you not, like every time, like un like involuntary, I burst into tears. I'm like, oh wait, maybe, I, maybe I'm still processing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what hit me was there's this, there's a page in there that's, um, you know, it's just, you can only see cut off like the parent's arm. She's holding the little girl and the grandma saying bye. And I literally have that image in my head of the first time we left Taiwan, moving to the States. And then it hit me really hard that um, my daughter uh, during 2020 went over there to visit my parents. Uh, she's the first grandbaby. So the pandemic hit, she was only supposed to be there two months. She ended up being there nine months. Mm -hmm. Blessing in disguise, we weren't there with her. That sucked, but my family got to be with her. My parents moved back to Taiwan shortly before I got pregnant. Um, they, I don't think it, we, it wasn't planned. So I don't, I don't know if they would have stayed in the States if they knew. Um, but they, you know, very much were like, why do you want your child back? Just leave her, just leave her here. It's like, <laughs> That's my She's daughter. So cute. <laughs> but, um, from that, when I brought her back, um, it hit me again, you know, I'm, I'm in a way I'm doing the exact same thing to my daughter that I was doing to my, that my parents did with me, you know, and I'm very blessed that I got to grow up with the opportunities that I did here, but, um, it had a very isolated childhood. Um, I did a lot of, I've always been in creative. Uh, I played piano and violin growing up. I wrote, um, I always painted, but all of those were isolated activities. I practiced at home. Um, eventually we joined an orchestra, but even practicing for those, like it's, I, I didn't do a lot of group activities. So for me, I escaped through my art. I stayed in my room so my mom wouldn't yell at me. And <laughs> I hung out and I drew and it wasn't honestly until I started doing public art that um, there truly was, I feel like, a transformation in the storytelling mm -hmm. behind my art. Um, because to me, the more public art that I did, I realized there's a responsibility that yeah. does come with public wow. art. Because it's one thing to just create something that's aesthetically pleasing, um, but it's another thing to be able to create something that has a lasting impact in a community and not just an impact because you can have a negative impact as well. You want to be able to highlight, you know, important voices and the voices that actually need to be uplifted in a community to create an impactful work. Um, and um, I think through doing public art, um, it, I, there's art, art can be so impactful. It can have a socio economical impact. It can have all kinds of things. It can just be a pretty picture. But I think that, you know, through art, you can do more than that. You can educate the public. You can bring, you know, awareness to issues. You can make change. And now that I have a little girl, you know, yeah, there's still times where I'm like, I just want to paint this goofy thing because I want to paint a goofy thing. But I mean, they say being a, becoming a parent changes your life. Apparently, it really does. <laughs> but you know, I I want I want to create a legacy to where I can model, you know, a life that she can be proud of and that I myself can be proud of. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, um, and I didn't get to, I she as a mom now I can understand just how difficult that role is. But for me, um, I I want my daughter to be able to see that there are options to what you can do. You can be a mom and an artist, mm -hmm. actually. Yep. And that wasn't a possibility that was even dealt. 
as a possibility for me growing up. It was always like, you want to be an artist, you want to live in a box? Like, oh, uh, well, well, honey, you can be an artist too, but maybe get a real job. Even to this day, mm -hmm. for a long time, I felt when someone would be like, well, what do you do? It felt weird to be like, I'm an, like, I'm an artist. It, <laughs> like, I wish I could be like, hell yeah, I'm an artist, which I'm getting to that point now. But <laughs> for a long time, it still was still, I'm an artist. But um, we went to a paint jam the other day and someone asked my daughter, she's four, asked her what her name was and she said, I'm Atticus, I'm the world's smallest artist. <laughs> and moments like that, I'm like, okay, like, I don't know what I'm doing, honestly, but. You're doing something. Right. Times like that, I'm like, something's going right. The kids will be all right. Yeah. Yeah. So it was escapism for me and now it's, honestly, it's a way for me to get out in the world, like I mentioned before, which is lovely because I'm terrified. Who <laughs> <laughs> went to for it to another? <laughs> so you guys have all talked about how art is so impactful uh well as a former educator in a type of way i don't know probably still educating the masses you know yeah. well as two current educators how have you guys been using this in your courses i know you created a new class solely on art so you already got it on and popping mm -hmm. so i just want to know how you guys are like embedding art in your courses so it's not only the course I created, I realized I'm in my office trying to clean up everything because I'm retiring. And as I go through papers, I am just amazed at how much art was incorporated in my classes, just generally. I found um, video storytelling around suicide that a student presented to me. I've seen um, PSA announcements on various topics related to whatever the victimology or addictions or whatever. Because I've always given my students this opportunity, and it's for mental health, by the way, as well. So I give them this amazing opportunity just to express themselves in a way that's creative. And I'm just finding all this stuff. And I said, Rosie, you were a really good teacher, <laughs> weren't you? Still and so I'm acknowledging the fact that I've incorporated art in my work almost always. Almost always, yeah. And as a sociologist, we study anything. I tell my students we have a license to be nosy. So anything, you know, is what we want to know, we want to study, we want to create, and it provides them this amazing opportunity just to do that. That's why I hang out with you. That's why I hang out with you. All right, then. <laughs> um, I, I uh, created a class, too. Like, we have topics in creative writing. Um, so one of the classes that I created was poetry and performance. Uh, which I'll be teaching next semester if anybody wants to take it. My grandson it. is waiting. Hey. Yeah. I have a grandson here, Did by the way. Oh. Um, but <laughs> it's it's uh, pretty much learning poetry and the performance side of it for uh, public art uh, because there's a confidence building that happens with that. Um, and, and then I think a lot of people think that you just, as long as you're not shy, you can just get up and talk. And that's not how it works. Like there's research involved and like all of these things that go into a performance. Um, so I, I try to, that's my favorite class to teach. Um, but other ways that I incorporate art into my classes, sometimes I will start a new, I'm gonna say module or subject or essay topic or whatever. Um, I will start it off with a poem and, and I you know, do poetry for my classes just to kind of introduce a subject, to get them excited about it. Not only that, but I think me doing poetry shows my passion for what I teach. And I tell my students all the time, everyone's had that teacher that just wanted to be a coach, but they had to give out worksheets in a math class or teach you how to drive or whatever, you know, some other class, but that wasn't what they really wanted to do. So I think if my students see my passion for what I'm teaching, it helps, you know, build a relationship that they want to learn from me. Yeah. Um, so I would say, um, so I, I didn't create any art classes or anything, but I think now with Raising the Sun, the organization, we have the ability to use art as a tool and create programs, right, that then um, speak to a lot of the issues within the community or they're focused toward women empowerment or a advancing different messages or missions or elevating other organizations or collaborations in art is in the center of that, it, that intersection, right? Um, and so right now, obviously, we're doing, I think you all is building um, a curation here in which this was a grant that we wrote 
um, two and a half years ago talk about vision and like mm -hmm. working hard. A lot of times people, you know, you get to this phase with the artist and it's incredible. It's like the greatest <laughs> thing. But a year and two years ago, you know, we were right. out there like writing and trying to gather funds and gather partners and map out the vision and find a wall and find it, you know, like none of it was created, you know, like we just had to figure it out. And so people don't see that. They don't see any of that. They just like, oh, you know, but I love it that you can get through that journey and get to places like this and you really then see the power of art. Yeah. You see it, right? You can feel it, right? And it's like two, three years ago, we had to see that, that vision, right? Um, and then create a path to where we can get to this and then be steadfast about it, like, like and very focused about it. Um, so I think to me, that's what we, we are in the business of doing is, is creating these opportunities, um, art installations. And then also, I think I would say, looking at uh, ways to bring community together through creative placemaking, right? So understanding how you can see a blank lot or you know an empty building or a warehouse and how you can temporarily utilize that space then to activate it, mm -hmm. right? So looking at it in that sense too, it's, it's programmatic in and of itself because you mm -hmm. can utilize space to, to you know solve issues and stuff so i think just yeah so that's my programs but that's uh, nice that's wonderful yeah, yeah. i want to ask a hop in and ask a question since we talk about the dickie lawless building and the mural one of the themes of the upcoming mural dealt with resilience it was climate change and resilience was the thing that we had for the whole entire grant so then how do you encompass resilience in your different fields um especially during this these times a couple years ago i created a class called genocide trauma and resilience and specifically looked at uh, rwanda during that 90-day war and so it allowed us to i had them go to the holocaust museum I had a guest speaker from Rwanda online on Zoom. Uh, we looked at um, too often the death, which created a, for us as students, as a teacher, a moments when we were overwhelmed. You know, it affects our body. Trauma, yeah. Trauma. So I was embedded. Trauma was out, it was jumping onto me in a sense. And so that was the that was the genocide. The trauma piece was they had to look at. African Americans as um, as one who was experienced genocide as well, and what did that look like in in light of trauma? But the resilient piece, the resilience was critical to that course, not only for students to move from and through, but to understand that in the midst of all this, we still stand. Come on now, hope. We're here. Yeah, uh, we're here. Not only we're here, but we're powerful because we're here. Right. And if we weren't powerful, we wouldn't be here. Yes. Uh, and so in that class, they had to, there's always a creative piece. They had to do a creative piece and, and study in Rwanda and how they worked through their trauma, taught lessons, gave us lessons as well as what we can do. Um, I'm a social worker by, by profession. I teach a course in social work. And so throughout that class, we are dealing with the emotional skills. How do you interview, how you talk? And, what does what does trauma look like? How is it manifested? And what we need to do about it? So, so you're built, you're seeing resilience through the structures of classes. You're seeing resilience, and you're somewhat essentially guiding and teaching your students how to move through resilience. I mean, through trauma if that comes, and then having that resilience on the end. I do that, and we also, I also taught a course called Resu uh, Restorative Justice. We actually did a presentation together at a conference. Uh, and so we do check-ins. We check in if on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling today? If you're five and below, um, talk to me. I need to talk to you and see if there's anything I need to do to help you. Yeah. And I do that on my classes. The, yesterday I had my students, I just drew a, a face, a circle. I said, this is now put in it your face and tell me, and then I had students, to, they did, and I asked the students, how is she feeling right now? And they would, sit, they, would, they would guess at it, and then I asked the student who did it, was the person accurate? 
Yes, what number are you? I'm a six today. And so those are another ways in which we allow students to use art to assess their mental health. And then we can then move forward with that. And, and if you don't assess mental health, they're not going to learn anyway. Yeah. Right. Okay. Breaking in barriers. Anybody? I'm going to say what she said. <laughs> <laughs> I do the same thing. Uh, sometimes I do it uh, with something called synectics to get people to think outside of the box, to create creatives. Uh, so like you could ask a student, um, how are you feeling today? If you had to be either a bowl of spaghetti or a bowl of ice cream, which one would you be and why? Now, somebody could say that bowl of ice cream, they feel very alone because they're cold. Somebody might say that bowl of ice cream and say, I'm feeling sweet, I'm chilling. You know, it's two different things, but having to think about things in a different way still assesses how somebody's feeling. Um, so I do the same thing and just I found lots of ways to do it. <laughs> you know she's my little sister <laughs> and I'm her big sister so yes. what can I tell you <laughs> well I guess I guess just to make sure we're staying on time and that everyone's I guess we can discuss like legacy have it be our last DJ yeah right. is it time for like some questions I mean we can we can do questions if you guys feel more comfortable with questions right now do you guys have open questions? it up any questions any questions I have a question uh, I think Professor uh, Huber spoke about being the best. How do you guys value yourself? Ooh, and how good. do you encourage others to know the value of themselves? So I'm just now, like literally in the last, since February, that, that has been me kind of learning myself and valuing myself more. Um, and, and I have, I have come to the realization that I am the prize in a relationship, in a job, in anything. And so if I'm not having my needs met the way I think, then got to go. <laughs> um, but valuing myself, uh, I think it's modeling that for my students. Um, I think I do that naturally just because I have, I have kids, you know, and try, I try to model that. I, that's another reason why I'm like, yes, I'm an artist because I want my kids to feel like they can do anything they want to do because I want them to do something they want to do so then it doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I tell my students. What are, you, what are you doing? Are you here because your parents told you to be here? Um, did they tell you to study that or is that what you chose? You know, I, I'm really focused on letting students decide where they want to go and, and really pushing that. For me, God makes no mistakes. And um, I, I, I don't think I'll ever have a problem not valuing myself. I know who I am. I know who I am in God. I know who I am in terms of how I have developed over these years. And I've explained to some, in some way how I help students to know that they are important and significant. This is done routinely for me because, like I said, I'm trained social work. I wasn't going to be a teacher. And so now I realize, I have just recently realized that I'm a social worker so that I can be that to my students. Mm -hmm. I teach because I had to learn that. But as a social worker, you'd be surprised how many times that in my office I hear their stories yeah. and they, they feel that this is a safe place. In my classes, we have safe places and I let them know that in this space, what's said in here stays in here and that we have the responsibility of of guarding each other's heart in this place. Right. And so um, if you ask any of my students, and I have so many of them, they would come back 20 years later and say, Dr. Martin, I know I was, I didn't do, I didn't do well in your class, but I learned what you taught me and thank you because they know that I care for them. And I think that's the important part. They have to know we care. Um, I would just say, I think that's a really great question. I think um, it brought me back to understanding the power of a, somebody that I looked up to telling me that I was great, whether it was my dad, or whether it was just somebody in the local community that I, that I aspired to be and that I saw elevated, and for them to come back and say, hey, you know, Raisin, you can do this, you know? Um, so I think it's, you know, it, it's one thing 
for somebody to say I'm great than for Lizzo to tell me I'm great or, for, <laughs> you know, Michelle Obama to say, hey, you doing it, keep going, you know, so I think that inspires people to so many levels when they can follow your journey and they see you transforming and being able to lead others and then you say, hey, you can do that too. You just, as a matter of fact, you can do even better than me. You're good. You're young. You're you're yeah. ready to go. Like you've got yeah. this about you. You've got the shine about you. So I think understanding that power it makes me more interested and attracted in giving, yes. giving out, right? Because I love to see that uh, inspiration in others. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, honestly, uh, a lot of the value I place on myself I've gained through my mistakes in life. Um, I truly believe that. I have never learned a lesson harder than the biggest mistakes I've ever made, whether it's not valuing myself enough. And I learned that I truly am worth more than what I've given myself or was given to be. Um, but I, I really think, um, especially in the last couple of years, I've learned that um, it's easy to get down about mistakes or bad things that happen. But for me, uh, it's a part of that resiliency um, every mistake is a lesson. I learned something from every bad thing that's ever happened to me. And I, here I am still living, still standing. And I know I'm worth more than I was yesterday and the day before, because I'm growing mm -hmm. every single day. Um, so that's yeah. good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I grew up in a household where my mother said that the artists are the prophets of their time. Wow. So my first question is, how do you survive? How do you rest to be seers and prophets and visionaries? What is that? I'm all about rest. And the second yeah. question is based on one of your comments. You said we have a responsibility as artists. And I wonder if you all would talk about responsibility in what we um, what we gift to our community. Yeah, so you I said rest and rest and responsibility. Rest and responsibility. Oh, that okay. one right. I see. Art this is powerful. Art to the second. Yes. Um, second so we're quick because I think everybody can chime in on that. I think rest absolutely brings balance. And just to be honest with all of you guys, the last year I've struggled with that. Mm -hmm. I have struggled with that. I don't sleep. Man, me neither. <laughs> God. When you talk about responsibility and you know the things in your lifetime and you understand it was like yesterday I was 25. What am I doing here? Like, why am I here? And I can't sleep because to me, you know, it's more important to tackle the responsibility of my life and purpose. So yeah, mm -hmm. you hit it. Yeah. You hit that today. Let me jump on that one. I I do not sleep yeah. either. Um, I, take, I, I love wine. I love Moscato in the evenings. Uh, I take two Benadryl each night. Um, and I have to take that at a certain time just to be able to go to sleep. And then I won't stay asleep because being a creative is a blessing and a curse. It is. Um, and, and poems are bullies words or bullies because they will be like no you gotta write this right now uh, at two o'clock in the morning i'll be like oh let me get my phone out and i'm like it, it, everything is a mess at the beginning because i'm not fully awake sometimes i will write things and will not know what i wrote until i'm done it's almost like a an outer body experience sometimes but i, I don't sleep either and it's tough um and i, I don't know how like it's like you want to embrace it, but because like that's where the creativity, like Half the arts. art comes yeah, from, you does. know? Uh, and if I just, if I try, and I have tried to be like, nah, I'm gonna write it down in the morning, I'll remember it. For one, it'll be gone. Mm -hmm. um, or 
I'll never go back to sleep because I'll start thinking of everything else. Well, no, because the next line after that is this, and then, right. and then the next line after that and is this. And that's when you least distract Woo! Yeah. yeah um, so it's, it's, it's ongoing and it's tough, but um, just knowing that I have to get it out for it to disappear keeps me going. That's my responsibility is to get it out. Not to sleep, however, <laughs> it's not shortens your life. Does. And in doing so, others will lose out on the gifts that you have. Yeah. Right. Lose that balance. Then. You need that balance. So I sometimes have difficulty sleeping, but I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm looking I'm at different, different options. I'm, I just got back from South Africa on what day was it? I don't know, Saturday. Because I'm trying, I'm still sleepy. <laughs> and um, throughout the, these last three days, all of a sudden the sleep hits. I don't know when. Yesterday was in class. I was yawning. You guys knew I went to South Africa. Forgive me. Okay. <laughs> so, but the sleep gives you the energy you need to go forward to do your best work. So my recommendation to, uh, to all of us all of us, Rest is all of us, to find a way, a time, and it's biblical, by the way, biblical, it's biblical, there's a time for everything under the sun, and we need to really begin to learn about that. Sometimes it's just like, it's it, like what you're saying, and I can attest even to raisins, like, sometimes you just gotta, like, shut it off, and you may have to start your wind down periods at an earlier time in the day. I'm all about sleep. <laughs> all about sleep. I would love to be all about it. And so, but I understand, and I think that comes from me, like, in my business, in health and wellness and understanding, that's when your body on a cellular level is regenerating. If you're not allowing it, then you're allowing your body to be more susceptible to Illness. illnesses. Illnesses. I need you around a long time because I know I'm going first. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I would like to know, this This is a random question, y'all, but I, I literally had a conversation about this the other day with someone um, because I'm like, okay, the people that are geniuses in this world, like, because they use their brain so much, are those the people that are, like, I want a, a study on people that, um, what is it when you start losing memory and stuff? Alzheimer's. 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 Like, people with Alzheimer's and stuff, I'm wondering, like, what they do in life. Before? Yes. Like, how... I don't know. That's just random, but I've always wanted random. to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to be one of them for you to learn. But I, don't know, I, don't really, I recently I don't want you to learn on me. That were going like I had family members that you know started showing Alzheimer, and and they were like creatives, and I was like, hmm. you know, my grandmother had it for over twenty five years. Yeah, she got it like in her sixties, and just passed two years ago. Wow. Yeah. She lived with it for over 20 years. That's a long time. I worry so about when my brain's going to stop working. Sometimes I want it to stop. <laughs> but not that but way. Not, not that, that way. way. Oh, I'll say no, not I'll that way. Say that's that's what makes me start thinking about things like that. But what about you, Candy? Your R to the second power. So I do like how you pose that question because it's really a question of responsibility to the public and then your responsibility to yourself. Yep. Um, I think as creatives, it's not like, I don't know, it's not like, you know, being you know, a banker or something. You you take your job home every day at home. Yeah, I don't I don't think I rest. <laughs> you know, um, at home, my partner is also a creative. Um, so we we talk art twenty four seven. It'll be our anniversary, and we'll be like, let's not talk business today. And no matter because it's just life. Like every day, our life is art. We just we we both do art. It's hard not to. Um, I also don't sleep. <laughs> But for various reasons. You have a baby. The four-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think for me, this last year, I've really, uh, my stress level's all over the place typically, but I've come to realize, for me, it's not so much rest. I know rest comes in a lot of different forms for different yeah. people. But for me, a lot of my um, cortisol spikes come from just rushing. I realize I've lived a life of just rushing or fearing that I'm being late or the responsibility to this imagined mm -hmm. concept yeah. <laughs> of time. And for this last year, I've made a commitment to myself, even if I'm a little bit late, like I, I'm not going to take it out on my mental health mm -hmm. to have that perceived Thank notion you. of 
rushing to be somewhere because it's never an emergency. No. And I feel it trickle down to my daughter. There are times when, you know, we're rushing so we don't get her ready on time, but then at the last minute we're like, why are you ready? It's like, no, no, that's, that's on me. And also there's no, nothing is so important that we're five minutes late to you that I have to Put that on disturb her. my Put mental that health or my three year old mental yeah, right. health. And the anxiety that gets on her from that. And I think a lot of it came from my dad. I love my dad so much, but he was the oldest of like six. And um, he, to this day, and I didn't notice until a few years ago, we're on vacation. We're on vacation. Day in the morning, he's like, everybody get up. Like, oh, get up. <laughs> <laughs> we're relaxing every day. And I was not a morning person. So I'm like, that's where that comes from. That's where that comes from. Yeah, so I've been unpacking a lot of internal traumas the last yeah. couple of years. And um, I've been, it's been interesting, especially as a parent, being able to pick where different things come from because I do not want to pass that on to my child. Thank you, Taylor. Um, but uh, for me, rushing rest, I'm slowly getting used to four or six hours of sleep. Even if I have time to sleep, my peaceful hours are at four in the morning when no one bothers me. So I'm up regardless. Mm -hmm. But for me, my stress comes from rushing. Mm -hmm. So as long as I have time to mentally stabilize my emotions, mm -hmm. um, I, I get plenty of rest because right. I mean, I'm invigorated through doing art. You know, right. I, that's what, that's what keeps me alive. <laughs> yeah. Yes. One more question. Yeah. I liked your prompt earlier. To answer your question, bowl of spaghetti. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to make something warm and tasty out of a mess of noodles. So along with me trying to make something warm and tasty out of this mess, what advice or guidance would y'all give somebody that's trying to be where y'all are? Like, I came, because Raising the Sun has been such like an inspiration. And to hear you say, like, those two years, three years, and you didn't know what was going on. You're like, we just doing things. Eventually, mm -hmm. to look back, you're like, it's unbelievable. Like we're here now, but seeing your murals, mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm an artist myself, and like, you know, it's it's inspiring to see where you all have these walks of life that you impact daily. See, like what you do, the guidance and advice, please. <laughs> So for what, whatever art you want to do, keep doing it. Yes. It doesn't matter how it comes out. Don't expect things to be perfect from the beginning. Um, with writing, I tell people, hey, take a piece of paper. Like, no, you don't got to sit down and type nothing. Just take a piece of paper and you're going to write on it because that's how writing started, you know. <laughs> but take that piece of paper, crumble it up. Now open it back up. Now start writing on it. It's already messed up. Don't worry about things looking perfect. Get the story out, get the poem out, get the song out, whatever it is you're trying to do, keep doing it because it, it takes a lot of it for you to figure out what your craft is, your style is, your voice is. You just got to figure that out. And once you figure out who you are, just be you, you know, let everybody else get on board. I'm going to be me. And she is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I actually started doing art at age 75. I'm 79. I, uh, no way. <laughs> you better stop it. In fact, I turned 79 the day I arrived in South Africa. And I was like, God, this That's is amazing. Well, this happy is birthday. Birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. And I actually started my art um, four years ago. And it, it came from a book I read that was... Um, art through praying through art and it was a storyline that a person was trying to pray for a friend and for some reason she couldn't so she was doodling on paper and that freed her so she used to put the person's name in it and all of a sudden she was able to offer this prayer up and when she looked at it anytime she could offer this prayer up right so I started doing that and eventually it became people and birds and trees and whatever whatever so my message is it doesn't matter age is just a number be open to whatever gifts God gives you at the time of your life that he gives it to you. You can't be me, I can't be you. Now, I've been writing poetry forever, indefinitely. You know, heartbreak does that <laughs> way back when. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so you just have to be open and say, yes, Lord, I can do this and not, not criticize it, not deny it um, and do it. 
I agree. Just you just gotta keep doing it. Honestly, um, you do it when you're upset. Do it when you're happy. Do it when it's awful. Just start doing it. And the thing is, like, no one, no one will care about your art the way you do yourself. No one will understand it. No one's gonna push you the way you do. If you don't push yourself, nothing will do that for you. And you honestly, you have to push through, you know, the hard times of, you know, just because you're creative and you feel like it should come naturally to you, it doesn't always. And I think, you know, harping back on the whole thing with rest and balance, it's about balance. Um, it is. I think if you truly define yourself as a creative, it can be really hard when you have moments where you have creative blocks. Cause you're like, you know, it's the one thing you're like, you define yourself as. Um, for me, you know, I've gone through periods where I, I painted a lot of stuff for free. I painted stuff people no one ever saw. I painted terrible things. Um, I went through periods where I thought I would never paint again. Um, I, I lost all my creative facilities uh, when I got pregnant. I was building a tiny human. I don't know if that, I don't know if it was actually something, it was like, um, psychosomatic or if it was actually something that was happening but I felt like I couldn't create wow. and being someone who's been a creative my whole life that was very hard for me and maybe it was hormones because now thinking back I'm like you had it girl like you were fine you know you got this but at that time I felt completely lost because that was my whole definition of who I was and not only that I was with my partner who was also an artist and i was like if i'm not an artist do i even deserve love from someone who oh like would he continue to love me like obviously hormones <laughs> <laughs> he loves me very much um but um i think it comes with giving yourself you have to give yourself grace as an artist because there will be so many times when you're just like you don't want to or you can't, you literally can't um our brains are complex life is hard <laughs> there's lots of times when you just won't be able to paint and it's okay it's gonna be there some i've had to get jobs before where at the end of the day it's depressing because i i'm too tired to work on my own thing even now my art is my job there are days where i'm like i need to escape from the thing i love and luckily i have music i have writing i have you know my friends and family i think it's important just to make sure you have balance when you're doing it and keep that in mind yeah push yourself Always do it. You'll never get better unless you do it. And put yourself out there. Paint the crappy walls. Write the, do the things for free. Do things, favors for people. Like, help people out. Like, be a part of the community. Engage. Eventually, you put yourself out there, you will be seen. Mm -hmm. So just, honestly, just keep doing it. I never thought I would be here. I literally wake up every day and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, this is tight. I'm like, this is super cool. But yeah, even five years ago, like, I mean, this was the dream, but it was always like one day, one day. and then it <laughs> happens. Uh, oh no, what's happening? <laughs> and now it's happening and, and it, it keeps happening and you just got to kind of be prepared. And, yeah. you know, I don't know. Everyone's journey is different, but um, I think I wish someone would have told me like, chill, everything at its own time. I, especially now, I feel like time is just like, <laughs> and so it, 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 it makes you feel like you have to rush and you have to make things and then for younger generation of artists oh my god social media and then we're all products of capital capitalism and all uh, and yeah, now, uh, yeah yeah anyway yes yeah. 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 yeah and yeah. so it's <laughs> it's it's balance it's balance do what feels right for you but just keep making stuff just keep making stuff even if it's terrible yeah it's something you know yeah i think it's important just to keep creating yeah. Everything you got anything? Let's see. So connect with me after, because um, it's it's more than just this thirty seconds. So what I'll give you, um, it's it's being it's to piggyback on the journey. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It really is. Um, you have to be agile, flexible, a student of life. You have to learn lessons. You gotta say no sometimes, and sometimes you gotta say yes. You gotta overcome fears. You got to, you know, look at what you really want your legacy to be and how and what that looks like and connects to your responsibility to your environment and your community, your family, your ancestors. Um, it's bigger than you, but your gift that you have is for a purpose. 
here in your lifetime and your dot on your timeline. So if I could leave anything with you, I would say be water and flow and, and, and have faith that nobody can take your vision and your dream away. Yeah. Nobody. You can only do that. But you have been put here and it is just a path ready for you to go and has been set forth by you. So have that confidence and speak because that makes you a transform transformational leader when you can have that confidence and instill it in others. So I love your energy and I and I and I almost feel and see your vision. So my 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 encouragement to you is to stay steadfast and begin your journey and and and, and live in that purpose of what you're here to do. I'm not gonna lie, listening to you guys like as a because there's always this emphasis on getting everything done when you're like before you're 25, you're supposed to be established, have a big girl job, have a grown lady hobby, you know, it's a big and then, you know, just having everything set. So hearing you guys talk about you know the struggles you guys went through your journey, not having everything like figured out at a young age, picking up new hobbies when you're older. It's just, it's really inspirational. I'm not trying to shed a tear because I'm a little dehydrated. I need to. <laughs> <laughs> Drink water. This, is, this is awesome. Yeah, the, I don't want to piggyback in closing, just saying that it's something always inspiring and uplifting when women are able to connect, share, and uplift each other. So I do want to thank HT for allowing us to be a part of this Racing in the Sun. Um, Doctor, Doctor Kruger, Kruger <laughs> Doctor Martin, <laughs> Candy Co, Raisin McIntosh. Thank you guys for joining us, um, and hopefully this will be the last plug. We will be unveiling this um, for Earth Day 2023, which will be April 22nd. Wow. So share we'll be sharing, share, 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 share but we'll be posting. And also, too, we have a quick sorry. Um, from Austin Waters uh, Shed to come up and share something. They are, one of our um, partnerships with our mural project was the East Austin Environmental Initiative. So Oscar Garza, but I know she wants to share some information uh, real quick with you guys. Thank you we so head out. much. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for the opportunity. So I'm Sadia Albornoz, I'm with Watershed Protection with the city of Austin, um, and just wanted to invite you all to weigh in. We're updating our strategic plan for the department, so that's what dictates or it's the blueprint for everything we do as a department. Um, and our department deals with water from the time it falls um, as rain um, until it's in our creeks and lakes um, as it goes into the landscape. So storm drain infrastructure, um, education about um, how to keep our water clean, um, and uh, all, just all kinds of programming. Adapting a over. creek. Adapting a creek. Our neighborhood um, association is doing that, adapting a creek. Yes, yeah, flood mm -hmm. safety, um, just all kinds of things. So. Um, we're asking you to take a survey. We have some flyers back there with the QR code. Um, the survey closes March 31st. Um, and so we just want to hear from you about your ideas, your experiences with flooding, erosion, water pollution, and with our creeks and lakes. Um, so thank you so much thank for the opportunity to share. Um, and let's clap it up for our panel, guys. Yes, 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 yes. If you're also too free this weekend, we have our closing event for our artist Elizabeth Lopez at the um, Blue House Project. We'll check out our website, check out our Instagram. Um, but I do want to say, and I hope you guys were able to get your souls fed, because I was over here trying not to cry many times. And I was <laughs> yes. that kid, and I was like, don't you cry, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you again. Thank you, guys. Thank you, HT. And thank you, uh, President Williams, for letting us be a part of this. And thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you.